that's fine. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Um, now, what, what I wanted to ask here is, uh, in addition to, to that question, is when I was looking at the Veda, and I memorized the, uh, the Hindu, the Sanskrit, just to, oh, right. yes, a little bit of it, no, not all of it, uh, where it says in, um, in, the, in the Upanishads, the Upanishads is part of the literature that is right, acceptable yeah. in the Hindu tradition. I think it's in the sec- uh, sixth chapter, you know, in the, first, uh, in the fourth uh, section, in the first verse, it says, Ikkam Ivaditya. So where it says that, you know, God is one without a second. Right. Um, and it's also mentioned, you know, in the Upan. It's also mentioned in the Vedas, in Ajur Veda, in the thirty-second chapter, in the second verse, that God has no image. There's no likeness of God. Which, obviously, as a Muslim, when I approach this kind of information, it um, it's more f- familiar to me because oh, we believe in monotheism and we believe in one God and things like that. So, how would you reconcile the fact? This is my question, really. Uh, that. The Vedas and the, the Vedic literature in general make it very clear that you should only believe in one God on the one hand, but then there are these mentions of multiplicity of gods right. in the Vedic literature. Right. Well, first of all, the idea of the, is that uh, God has no material form. Like, we have a material form, which is, uh, which is temporary and defective in so many ways, but, but he has a spiritual form. So, okay. so when, when there's a reference to God as not having a form, it's meaning he doesn't have a form like ours. What about the other reference that he's one without a second? How would you deal that's, with that? That's true. That, that, um, well, although he's one without a second, that he, he can expand himself into forms of equal potency and he's still the same person. Let me tell you something that the Quran says and I just want you to yeah. give me your opinion on it because yeah. it's quite interesting you're saying this. In the Quran, in the 23rd chapter, in the 91st verse, if I'm correct, correctly remembering, it makes the argument that had there been more than one God, that each of those gods would fight one another for the ultimate dominion or for the ultimate, so they will be fighting each other. Um, and if you think of it from a philosophical perspective, if we think of God as having one will, if you will, right? But what makes God God is the fact that he is able to put everything underneath him. As you mentioned before with uh, with, with Vishnu, uh, sorry, with uh, Krishna, right. isn't it? So the fact that he is able to subordinate everything else uh, and that he is the ultimate power and the ultimate will. In other words, no will can supersede his will. Do you see what I mean? So the, the question of how could it be the case that there is more than one God, I guess my question to you is, how could it be the case that you can have more than one ultimate God, which has more than one ultimate will, wouldn't the wills contradict each other? Well, see, when you have Krishna expanding into Vishnu, the same, the same person is manifesting multifariously. So it's not a question of uh, multiple beings, but a, a being with multiple forms acting in different so ways. So are you talking about like pantheism, if you will? No, no, because he's, he's the same person. Right. So you're there's not, no, you're not there's espousing no real a pantheistic... difference between, between Krishna and Vishnu. So you don't believe in pantheism, or do you do believe in pantheism? See, I think pantheism is where God is sort of spread everywhere. out everywhere. Yeah. Uh, so, so the idea is that um, we don't believe in pantheism. We, we believe that God is spread out everywhere, but He doesn't lose His identity as as a supreme person. And once again, are you talking about Krishna here, or are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah. Vishnu, okay. Krishna, then. So, all right. But there, what it was, there's, a, there's a, a term known as Vishnu Tattva, which refers to the category of God. So, why would it say then in Avajurvet, um in the 32nd chapter, in the, in the second verse, that there's no image of him? And you, we see so many images here in the, right. Hindu, in the Hindu tradition. Well, there, there's, um, like I say, there's, uh, there's, uh, God has no material form. So, when 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 it's when God is described as without form, it means He has no material form. Because so you do believe there, in there's a God. other places where it's described that God has a spiritual form. Right. And even even in the Christian tradition, there's an idea that we are created in the image of God, which is, implies that God has as an actual form. And and there's actually within within the Puranas, there's places where God says, "You can make a model of my form out of these eight elements." And you can worship it according to these rules, and through the medium of this form, I will reciprocate. Okay, so, so but so. what we're trying to establish here is really whether or not you believe that God is one. 
Yeah, God is one. So you do believe in God is one? Yeah. yeah there's right. like one verse, there's one verse. This is from the Upanishads. Yeah. Uh -huh. It goes, Nityo Nityanam, yeah. Chaitana Chaitananam, Eko Bahunam, Yoga Vedari Kamam. Of all eternal beings, there's one being. Of right. all, all conscious beings, there's, there's one being, one conscious being. And that being is fulfilling all the desires of all the that's other really beings. That's very yeah. interesting. That's, yeah, so, that's the, so, you, so you do believe in a monotheistic entity that yeah. controls the, the universes, that created the universes. Yes. Would, you say that, <clears throat> would you say that God is most merciful and all-powerful and potent? Yes, yes, yes. And would, you, would you ascribe those traditional sort of Abrahamic attributes of God? Uh, that you'd find in the Abrahamic religions to your your idea of God, your concept. Yeah, to, to Krishna or Vishnu. Whereas 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 this Brahma and Shiva, they they are they are just in the same. They're 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 in the category of Jiva Tattva, which means. Do you be, do you believe in these? Just sorry, just to cut you and ask you before this question comes out of my mind. But and this might seem like a funny question, but once again, you have to appreciate that we're coming from a yeah, different. Yeah, sure, right. Sure. Um, so you know these, uh, so like for example Garnish and the elephant god and, uh, and all of these gods, do you believe that they are actual beings, that they actually existed, that they are real? That's how they're described, you know, and it's, uh, there's, and it's described that people interacted with them at different times, but, but generally not at this time because at this period in time they're not, uh, the, the people aren't qualified to, to, to worship them, they're not worshipped properly. Okay, they're, so, therefore they don't appear. So are they like, real or not? They're real, but they're not, uh, they're not on the level of God, they're all subordinate to God. Okay, so that's interesting. So we both believe in an entity right. that has everything as a subordinate. Right, yeah. So God is the entity um, that has everything else as a subordinate. So that, I think that's, that's an how interesting. Is describing yeah, yeah. So I think that's a point of agreement. Yeah, that's that's a main point of agreement. So, so would you say that if I mean, what, let me say you our, our perspective, right? Because the way we say it is this: is I mean, just once again, just to give you um, our insight, we say that we believe in one God. Yeah. That that one God is separate from the creation inextricably, like in his actual essence. Right. So, for example, God is all knowing. We believe that God is all knowing, He's all mercy, merciful, but His mercy and knowledge is everywhere, but that He Himself isn't inextricably everywhere uh, like that. Yeah, so He's not within me and He's not within you, which is an important way to understand the difference between God, the Creator, and the creation. That's the first thing we would say. The second thing we would really say is that this one God, who is all powerful and is merciful and is the creator of the heavens and the earth, that He the purpose of life, we would say, there is a purpose of life, right. and that the purpose of life is to, first of all, come to realize this God, right. and secondly, come to worship this God. Right. So really, this is it. So to know this God and to worship this God. Uh, once that's been established, then you should follow the God's rules. And we would ask, where does God's rules come from? So we would say once again, that I'm not sure if you've heard this before, but you know, um, we believe that one God has sent many messengers. So from you can say Adam is a prophet, or Noah is a messenger, right. and from all of these individuals had one primary message and one primary um, really command for the people, which was to worship in one God and to, and to believe in one God. So the purpose of life, in a nutshell, from an Islamic perspective, is to worship God. And that one God that created me and that created you, that one God that is all-powerful and all-knowing, uh, and all these kind of things. Would you say that that makes sense, considering where you're coming from? Yeah, that all can be supported by Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, so it does make sense. Interesting, so... Basically, Krishna says three or uh, four things. Think of me, become my devotee, worship me, and offer homage to me. He says those four things. All right. So, I mean, what I don't have a problem with it, because uh, what we say is that, you know, people have this misconception, really, that before uh, Islam started with the Prophet Muhammad. Yeah. You see what I mean in this? in the 7th century, we, we say Islam is a word which is actually derived from another Arabic word called Istislam, which is submission. So really, we believe that the way to do your purpose is to be submissive to God, to do what He wants you to do. And that He sent messengers of all time, all of which had the same primary message. So it could very be, well be the case that He sent messengers and prophets to India. You know, I mean, because there is one weak tradition. It is weak, but it's, it's an interesting tradition that says there's 124,000 prophets that were sent of all times. You know, and each to their own people in their own time. So it's very, very conceivable to suggest that maybe there was a prophet. <coughs> 
that went to um, to went to India, and he spread the message of God, and then that message, which is the Mabarat, for example, or the the word God's word, then became uh, changed, became uh, a little bit, you know, corrupted. I mean, I'm not saying that. Um, Hinduism is, I mean, this is the thing. I'm not saying that some of the verses you've mentioned, I, I really associate with them. So I'm not saying Hinduism is all wrong. I think there's some parts of it which are right and some parts of it which are wrong, which I think you could identify with as well. Um, but we would say that the final messenger really is the Prophet Muhammad. And the difference between him and all the other prophets and messengers is that he came for all people at all times. And that the book, which is the Quran, which was revealed to him, is the only book to be preserved, the only religious book in ancient uh, religious history that has ever been preserved. And that this is a testimony to his authenticity. Yeah. So, um, just a quick question: Would you say that this is a conceivable uh, belief system where you, where all of these prophets and messengers came with that same message, and uh, and that they told their people to believe in one God and worship one God? Yeah. Yeah. Basically, um, uh, our spiritual teacher actually says something about that in one of the purports in the Bhagavad Gita, which is very much along the lines of uh, what you say. I have Bhagavad Gita on my phone. That's interesting, yeah. <laughs> I think we should uh, all have a Bhagavad Gita you know, on our phones. <laughs> just, just to download GitaBase. Go oh, okay, to so GitaBase.com. Nice. <laughs> any, any other websites you want to advertise in your phone? Um, oh no, GitaBase is the best one. I'm not, I'm not too aware Interesting, okay, no problem. There's one called Krishna.com too. Okay. So and also there's uh, Quran.com, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Might as well throw it out. Is there a yeah, Quran.com. Oh, right. The whole Quran is there. How is it spelled exactly? Q-U-R-A-N dot C-O-M. It's interesting, you know, for any person who wants to see what the Quran says yeah. in English language. You could you could refer to that one. 